Ja, herzlich willkommen zu äh, unserem äh, sonntäglichen Veranstaltungen ähm, der Lecture Performance mit Diana Bocchero Perez und dem Künstlerduo ähm, Honiti Goldocks. Ähm, diese Veranstaltung findet im Rahmen der Ausstellung Sentient Meta statt. Ähm, die ist ähm, kuratiert worden von Tutti RL und Tina Ribaritz, äh, zwei Kuratorinnen, die äh, ja, sich bei uns im D21 Kunstraum beworben haben für das äh, Jahresprogramm äh, Human Nature. Ähm, das ist nun die dritte große Ausstellung zu diesem Thema, ähm, wo wir also verschiedene Bilder von Natur, von äh, Garten, von Landschaftsgestaltung äh, und auch Perspektiven verhandeln. Und ähm, ich freue mich sehr, dass wir trotz dessen, dass die Ausstellung leider geschlossen sein muss aufgrund der äh, Pandemiesituation, wir aber jetzt eine, äh, ein Online-Event ähm, haben, wo wir zumindest mit den KünstlerInnen sprechen können und ähm, ja, mehr darüber erfahren. Ähm, und äh, die beiden Kuratorinnen werden jetzt auch etwas noch genauer über die, äh, ja, die Ausstellung, wie auch die heutigen ähm, also Künstlerinnen sagen. Ähm, da die äh, ganze Veranstaltung in Englisch ist, würde ich jetzt ähm, äh, quasi auf Englisch auch weitermachen. So, I would like to introduce äh, Tutte Erel und ähm, äh, Tina Ribaritz äh, as curators from this uh, current show at D21, uh, Sentient Matter. Hello everyone, uh, thank you so much for Constanzo introducing us. Uh, my name is Tutte Erel. And I'm Tina Rieberitz. And as the core curators of Sentient Matter, uh, we decided to have some online events. And then this is the second and the last uh, online live streaming that we are organizing. And in this uh, today's events, uh, we will be welcoming Elma Stinis, uh, Huditi Goldox, and then Diana Barquera Perez uh, lecture performances and then talks. Um, yeah, so would you like to introduce mm -hmm. a bit more the uh, Schedules Cost. today. Yeah. So we will start today's program with the artist talk by Elmas Dennis. Uh, Elmas lives and works in Istanbul, Turkey, where she is also joining us from today. Uh, she's uh, using a wide range of media, including installation, sculpture, video, drawing, and writings. And she investigates the intersections and points of entanglement between economics and nature and the capitalism-led deterioration of nature and especially our perception of this. And she will talk about her work, uh, Made to be Seen, from 2018, that she's uh, showing in the exhibition Sentient Matter. So uh, welcome, Elmas. Hmm. OK. Uh, Elmas, do you want to, to join us? Yes, I am. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hi, um, oh. I'm. Hello. Hello. Uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, inviting me for this exhibition and having me to, tonight for this talk. Also, uh, hi to everyone. And, okay. Um, um, I'm joining the talk from my studio in, in Istanbul. And um, um, actually, uh, first of all, I would like to show the video. Then I'll share my screen with you. Okay. Okay. First, I would like to, to show the video.
Now you are leaving the city. Soon you will find your true self in the hands of Mother Nature. Whatever you buy, they say it is natural. Nature like, from the nature. Now you see. Take a deep breath, relax. expensive, its value beyond calculation, rarest, for only limited time, for passionate, comfortable, fortunate you. It is powerful, sublime, elegant, and timeless. Fantasy, hope, poetry, and prestige. Refined, exotic, exceptional, extraordinary. Wouldn't you like to be the one who owns it?
Ok. Um, so in in two thousand in two thousand seventeen, then I received an email. Uh, it was from Colomboscop or uh, a festival in Sri, Sri Lanka, uh, and they invite me to produce a work. And um. Uh, uh, it's it's very typical for the artist. You receive an email, and then suddenly it's 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 a possibility to produce a new work. And and I travel there, and uh, the the uh, the idea of the work, uh, I mean, made to be seen, was a little bit earlier. Uh, actually, I wanted to make something related with the and the nature and the advertisements because. Uh, uh, even earlier, it wasn't the case. Uh, so, actually, after after the the, the pandemic, it became so visible, and also greenwashing uh, be, be, became something else. But back then, maybe in 2015, when I was into advertisement, I was into more into the, the pol political. Uh, political aspect of it. It wasn't that visible, but slowly, slowly it started. So what get my interest was the I was shopping in, in a in a in a typical super, supermarket in Istanbul, and I was always buying a colonia. It's a it's a so it usually have like. The, the, the typical um, flower scents, so like lavender or some flowers, but all those names. And suddenly they they had this production. It's called nature. So it it gained me attention because suddenly all these names of the flowers become something like a visible, um, a noun, uh, which is nature. Then I decided to make something else with the advertisement. Uh, to I, I would like to talk a little bit about my um, earlier works. Actually, that that would make sense. Uh, that I started to uh, in 2006. I did a solo exhibition in Istanbul, and it was about the Chernobyl power um, uh, Chernobyl ex um, uh, accident and things related around that uh, and, and later on in upcoming uh, uh, exhibitions I was more into like poverty related issues and then later I started to look into economy and then I I was thinking about the consumption culture and then how the consumption culture is is of course you end up in uh, nature because it's heavily destroying uh, nature and then I started to, to work on combining those uh, both of those uh, aspects and um, uh, like how our happiness is uh, is heavily attached with the um, uh, with the tank things that we we would like to buy or um, something really and then I decided to work uh, on uh, making something like an uh, advertisement of the nature, uh, a piece of nature. First, it was a mountain, and then it's it, anyway. So what happened uh, with this email that I invited to Sri Lanka? I went there, and then I was thinking to make some work uh, related with um, um, with. Um, plant transportation, because all these tropical plants are in our homes, in mainly in Europe. And, uh, and, and when I went there, uh, I was uh, uh, thinking also, I was just reading about the, the um, very, um, very interesting text about the history of advertisement. And that moment, I, I combined all, all those things. And the text was uh, written by uh, Ryan Russell and uh, uh, Williams, I'm sorry. 
uh, and it, it, it's called advertisement, the magic system. So this was my initial uh, kind of starting point. And um, what I've done is th in this video, I have this roughly, I divided in three. So one part is the beginning, as you see, is the, uh, it's all the things that we learn through advertisements, through how it is, um, in the language, in, in just, just um, in daily life, how people, they uh, set a relation with nature. So my argument is we definitely need to create another uh, relation with nature. This all my work is related with that. And to be able to do that, we have to invent some new way of uh, speaking about that. And then advertisements are very, um, uh, very affecting, uh, they are so much affecting our thoughts and how we also uh, relate with other things. So this is our language um, and it's all um, related with the, um, how we talk about things. And uh, so the first part uh, that we all want to leave the cities, we all want to be close to nature, especially people who are living in a really mm, enormous cities, like a big, big, big cities. They always have this uh, coach that they want to leave the city at some point. So this first part with the drone shots has this. And slowly, slowly it's getting it's like, maybe you realize that relax, relaxing, so taking a breath. So those things also related with the city culture. And the other thing is the advertisement. It's always saying that, and maybe for an artwork, it's a little bit open uh, already. So, and as I divided in roughly, and the second part is what I would call the, the words taken from the luxury advertisements. So when you see a commercial on TV, on radio, on internet, on like everywhere, so you always have a kind of a specific language attached to that. And nowadays it's the, the image of the nature. And uh, those, those words, like for instance, when I was making research, I came by this thing that if it's a very low class product, like a toilet paper, then you don't need to find those like a strange, uh, I, I call them strange uh, words, but for the very, um, uh, very luxury product, like a car or a swatch or whatever, I mean, uh, 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 so you need to have this very specific language. So I collect like hundreds of them and then I, chew, I, I embed it in the video, as you see, even like hope, um, like um, um, uh, hope, um, um, extraordinary. So these are giving a, um, these are giving a <clears throat> very um, specific. Um, uh, how can I say it? Specific uh, kind of essence to the the product itself. So um, I mean, as human beings, we need to set relations to other things around us, but it's always also including the emotions. So those words are selling us something that we also want to have in a way. Uh, so I combine all those things. Also the visuals is completely, completely, I, I didn't want to make it super perfect um, advertisement language. It would become a, a country, uh, uh, I mean, advertisement again. So I just used it slightly banded at the beginning also. It's a little bit art uh, work, uh, starting in artwork. It's very maybe boring even. And the last part is the important part, uh, I think. It also has a little bit, uh, speaking with my earlier works, uh, which I've done in, in Stockholm, it's called The Tree I Want to Buy. So there I am trying to, uh, to, trying to buy a tree, almost like 600 years of, uh, old. Uh, and the, 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 it's a very big tree, and then I'm just trying to buy it as simply as that. And um, 
this. For this video, I extended and I just uh, think about this and this um, and the the last part. But you see, wouldn't you like to be to to own all those things? And this is the uh, rainforest. So this is there is no limit to 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 owning. So for me, it's it. Um, mm, it's uh, my my approach, like how I look at it and how I see the work. Uh, and uh, there are also a lot of people who contributed. Uh, and Lara, she's an artist friend. She just uh, has this beautiful voice in it. Uh, I didn't want to have a super sexy, uh, also not so boring, but like, like a perfect, um, not like a, a native English speaker, but has kind of, and thanks to her, it became really something else that I had uh, added after I come back to Istanbul, after shooting. And yeah, this is uh, in, so when you look at the, what I can say also lastly, uh, when I look at uh, my other works, so you can see some drawings, some, uh, it's quite really wide range of media I'm using. So I'm not interested in, in, in becoming an expert in one media, but more like a thoughts. So all my verbs related with each other in a way. So this one has this unique character in a way because it has um, it, it has something to do. It, it has, how I can say, it's like a, I can see it is a big body of work. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's very different than the other in a way. Even though I am interested in human nature relation and non-human bodies and like nature economics and those combinations, this has a very uh, unique uh, space. And also, interestingly, it became uh, very popular uh, after the um, Corona pandemic, actually, because uh, um, because uh, people slowly, slowly come closer to to like um, questioning their ownerships, their relation with nature, and then how they are manipulated. This is maybe the biggest part because as we are artists we are uh, having experiencing a different life in a way um, so I think a lot of people they they had this their moment to stop a uh, moment and thinking about the other possibilities which uh, uh, which is we are all trying to do I think um, so what I can um, also say mm, it's also uh, related with um, looking at the take for granted elements in life um, yeah so thank thank you very much for um, listening and I try to focus on only this this piece uh, so um, I'm Living to the, the Dina and Tuche. And thanks again for listening. Thank you so much, Amos, uh, for your lovely uh, presentation and then showing the video again with us. And uh, now I would like to move to the next presentation. And then at the end, we will uh, come together for a live discussion. And now I would like to present Diana Barquera Perez. Uh, she's a Berlin-based artist who is coming from Costa Rica. Uh, Diana's work emphasizes processes of friction, transformation, and collapse. She deals with places that coexist in tension with so-called productive spaces. Uh, who are socio-political interests and tensions inscribed in the landscape? What are the subjects, materials, and processes that mediate its production? Through her artistic research, she seeks to answer these questions. For today's event, uh, Diana pre-recorded her lecture from her hometown, Costa Rica. We decided to do it uh, on purpose because she told us that she, her internet connection may not be stable. Uh, therefore, we will just uh, screen share and then 
uh, have her lecture pre-recorded and then she will try to join us later in the conversation section. So I would like to now share the screen. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Diana Marquero Perez. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, thank you all for the invitation. I want to thank Tuche, Constance, and Tina uh, for the kind invitation to be part of this talk. I'm really happy and honored to share the space with uh, such great artists as Elmas Dennis and Unity Goldox. Um, I will use this time to explain more in depth the research that I made be, behind the project that is called If You Think You Can Grasp Me, Think Again, which I developed during 2018 and 2019. Uh, this project resulted as, of a series of visual works, two of them uh, can be seen in the Sentient Matter exhibition. Uh, the project, I will share just a stick on the screen. Um, okay. So the project, if you think you can grasp me, think again, explores the transformations in the waterscape of the Terra Vasiepe National Wetland, which is located in the southern part of Costa Rica, uh, which is my homeland. Um, part of this research was carried out on the basis of uh, field trips in collaboration with Soledad Castro, uh, who was also an important part of the project since uh, she um, provided me a lot of uh, in-depth uh, knowledge of the environmental and social issues in and around the wetland. Um, Soledad is an environmental scientist that um, who works with pesticides and how pesticides affect the, this particular area. Uh, her work is framed in political ecology and critical geography scholarships. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Terra Vasepe wetland. Um, it's a state protected area, so it's protected, and it contains the biggest mangrove of Central America. It is fed by two main rivers, the Sierpe River and the Terraba River, and it runs alongside the Pacific Ocean. Um, this wetland has an approximate area of 33,000 hectares. Its delta has more than 3,000 years of human occupation. It was declared by the UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in 2014 due to the uh, presence of more than 300 stone spheres made by the native peoples. This wetland is also vital in terms of carbon fixation and based on its biological diversity, it has the category of the UNESCO Ramsar site also. Um, since the first records of the land change were perceived by satellite images, um, it became visible how the wetland area has shrunk. In here, you can see how the borders from the agricultural um, fields are clashing in a way with the wetland, with the protected area, no? Um, for example, uh, just a fact, from 2008 to 2016, more than 1,300 1, hectares of wetland were drained and transformed for agricultural purposes. Uh, nowadays, rice fields, uh, banana plantations and palm oil plantations are located within and outside the wetland, expanding the agricultural borders. Um, here you can perceive where is the wetland located and also, um, yeah, like the different farms that are around in, uh, in the wetland, no? with the different products like rice, palm oil, mixed uh, uh, bananas, etc. Uh, upstream, the Terreva River, the Del Monte Company has been developing large scale pineapple production for the past 40 years. This multinational inaugurated and consolidated fresh pineapple agribusiness, positioning Costa Rica as the world's leading pineapple exporter. Ex specifically, in this area, in the Dickies Delta area, that is where the wetland is located. Um, 
a considerable alteration of the social and environmental dynamics occurred with the arrival of the United Fruit Company. They were established in the Delta area from 1934 to 1984 and carried out a profound transformation of the waterscape. They created a complex system of water irrigation. They dried up parts of the, of the Terrava River in order to grow the banana plantations. In fact, uh, the United Fruit Company marks a before and after in the structure of agribusinesses. It was the first company to be formed as a multinational consortium, laying the basis of the foundations for transnationals in America. We were the first transnational in America. In addition, um, the UFCO inaugurated a new and a new and damaging paradigm in the way of cultivating by starting the application of pesticides for the first time in the country. Um, the UFCO constituted the turbulent chapter of US imperialism also in not only in Costa Rica, but in whole Latin America. Um, their wealth and monopoly models served them to similarly emulate uh, their strategies in all Central American countries and also in Colombia and Panama. Um, their strategies, uh, here you can see this, uh, Minor Cooper Keith and Samuel Samurai were the two owners of the UFCO. Minor Cooper Keith was the first one, and here's just an image of the plantations by the beginning of the century. Um, yeah, um, well, this, the strategies in our countries included bribing political figures to pay, obtain tax exemptions, preferential systems in tariffs, and the purchase of land at very low cost or no cost at all. Also, in order to reduce costs, they pressure politicians to maintain labor regulations that serve their interests to the detriment of the workers. For example, they didn't pay the workers with cash, they pay with coupons where you could change them in the store that was owned by them also. Um, and also the Obviously, they didn't have an eight-hour work um, time frame, um, and the working conditions were deplorable. Um, just also as a historical example of the modus operandi of the uh, company, um, they reacted to one of the largest strikes of workers in Colombia, that is called the Santa Marta uh, Santa Marta, the place um, where these workers were were demanding better working conditions, and they occupied the facilities and paralyzed operations in 1928. What the youth code did with the interference of the Colombian government and military is that they made a called banana workers massacre, where they killed 1,800 workers at least, and 100 more were injured. Also, the UFCO um, openly stated that and confirmed its participation in the coup de stat or yeah, like a state coup in Guatemala and in Honduras. Uh, coming back to what they did in Costa Rica, in this expansion and clearing of the forest, they discovered the dimensioned uh, spheres. Um, among other archaeological objects. Most of these objects were removed and looted uh, from the area without any archaeological study. Um, as in 1938, the UFPO in this area, in the Terra Sirpe uh, Delta area, in the Dikis Delta area, or the Terra Sirpe wetland area, um, they began a constant and excessive spraying of the fungicide known as caldo, caldo bordolés or Bordeaux mixture or copper sulfate, uh, which was used to kill a fungi that was causing a disease called Mal de Panama uh, or Cigatoga. Um, Cigatoga. Uh, this disease occurs because usually monoculture agriculture produces uh, a lack of biodiversity that generates uh, uh, an abnormal growing of parasites or uh, 
oranges. Um, yeah, so they started to uh, to to spray this this uh, substance from 1940s to 1960s. Uh, more than 12,000 workers per year applied this copper sulfate to the plantations. The spraying of this fungicide occurred at least 30 times a year, uh, causing in its prolonged exposure illness and death to many workers. Uh, one fact is that the people who used to do this work were called pericos, that it means like parrots, and it's because they were, since they were spraying up the, this pesticide, and it has this bluish color, uh, they became completely blue greenish, so they look like like a parrot. So they were called like this. Um, this uh, chemical left a layer in the a color layer in the soil that can be traced, and is named copper. It's named uh, as copper line um, for archaeologists and chem um, and geologists when they. And dig into the land, they can see this copper line from these times. <clears throat> when they are uh, studying the stratigraphic layers of the soil, uh, during the 60s and the 70s, they were also applying uh, another pesticide produced by Dow Chemical that is called Lemagon, which leads to really severe health consequences for more, uh, in this case, for more than 30,000 workers. Uh, many of them are still demanding justice, um, and in the area nowadays, it's still a lot of pesticides, multiple pesticides are applied in the new crops. Um, so, just to say a little bit about the uh, UFCO, the UFCO abandoned the area in 1984, uh, supposedly because of worker strikes that happened, a worker strike that happened in Costa Rica in the South Pacific. But it, um, it was a lie, it was a facade, because uh, in reality they left the place because the, uh, this disease has already spread throughout the plantations and the uh, plantations were sick. So they abandoned everything and they um, broke the contract with the government. They didn't pay the workers and they just flee, fled. Um, um, but now this, the people, that used to be the United Food Company were bought by Chiquita Brands and then they were bought, bought from other companies. So they are still in the area just with different names. Um, so now I will just uh, put a, a second a video uh, just to talk a little bit um, about the idea of the wetland and the idea of water as a center in this research. The video is about the documentation that I made from the, and Soledad made also some documentation of this, uh, of these pit trips during in the mangroves of the wetland. Uh, so I will just read something while you can see the video. Um, so experts point wetlands as one of the most productive ecosystems on earth since long and complex organism chains are produced in them they regulate vital cycles as such as the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle wetlands for example are responsible for the 10 to 20 percent of the carbon capture of the world making them really attractive sorry making them really attractive to conservationists, NGOs, and green lobbyists in times where the environment protection narrative is reduced to carbon fixation. As Michael Tosik expresses, the mangrove is a mighty assemblage at work, an exuberant entity that swings between pure and impure in an intoxicating mix of life and death. The composition and recomposition is a never ending cycle in the wetland. Mangrove zones, are areas that produce models of entangled affectivity and folding fertile matter in debris. As mentioned by Gingwala and Sihan, mangroves are spaces where the earth seems unearthly. They are sites of continual reconfiguration, neither sea nor land, neither river nor sea, bearing neither salty nor fresh water in neither daylight nor darkness. The mangrove is hence a landscape demanding extraordinary measures. 
the extraterritoriality defined by the porous, porous body of its borders requires rethinking the ways in which we imagine the idea of borders, as well as the multiple species, as the multi-species relationships that occur in the constant change that arise with tides, rains, and the drifting of sediments. The mangrove breaks with the in-out division, permeating these divisions into vigorous multiple transitions. The Terra Bauxierpe wetland is today in its porous body, still a body in resistance. Wetlands are a dynamic and changing waterscape. Its waters transport different materials and organisms back and forth, many kilometers away. As Terra Bauxierpe wetland is enclosed by monocrop plots, it also carries away pesticides, fertilizers, and polluted sediments. Contaminated water then becomes a center of events that follow both outside and inside the protected area. Being this said, it became important for me to work artistically with the idea of borders, to visualize the fiction that exists in trying to fix or contain a border in a porous body, such as the wetland. Also, I found it important to work with the matter that surrounds the wetland and the chemicals that have been historically used in the area. So now I will talk about the artistic visualization of the research. So I will share again the screen. Uh, just a minute, yeah. So, um, while I was researching for this project, I, I sought to find the resonating aspects and stories uh, of the area in order to build myself a panorama of this place. Uh, while I was researching, it became clear the challenge to build this panorama, um, since it has a lot of different possibilities and different stories and different, um, yeah, different ways of perceiving the wetland itself. So for me, this uh, poem of Adrian Rich, it is called Delta, resonated me resonated with me and with my feeling um, of this impossibility to grasp really a place no um, so yeah I found myself in the position of I, that I couldn't grasp the things that I was in contact with from the research um, in the moment that I tried to link the different layers of information and experiences that emerge from this encounter. But also this impossibility of grasping um, came with this sort of extra human voice that emerges from the poem. Uh, this voice that has multiple stories and flows in unsuspected ways. So I think the title of the exhibition uh, suggests then this impossibility and the human arrogance of grasping and conceiving the land and its resources as matters of extractive use considering them as passive elements for human and industrial use. Um, therefore, the name of the project seeks to make us question this oversimplification of the concept of land, of water, and of living and not living entities that live and cohabit in this environment. Um, so about the works uh, that are present in the exhibition, one is called Conglomerate. Um, and this work consists, this is an installation that consists of different sculptors uh, that are positioned onto, in, onto a aquarel carton that is, has a drawing of the map of the area. Um, in this exhibition, there are five conglomerates, but it depends on the size of the place. It could be more. Um, the conglomerates are built emulating the geological concept of a conglomerate, which is a, a concept in geology. And this concept uh, says it's uh, like a sedimentary stone that is made of other stones that are fixed together or bonded together. So I like this idea of the of the bonding of materials together. Um, to later destroy this bond in a way. Um, the conglomerates shape respond to the blocks of or plots of land of the 
that the UFCO made in the surrounding areas of the wetland. And uh, materials from the conglomerates are materials that also come from the areas near the wetland. Um, so the materials are clay, soil, plaster, cement, shells, pineapple, and banana peels, like organic materials. Um, and all these materialities or these materials respond to, to things that coexist in the area, artificial or more organic. Um, for example, there's also some raw a carbon also, uh, charcoal, coal, yeah. and uh, ropes. Uh, and the ropes are because they were used to tie the banana trees. And when the UFPA left the area, they just decided to bury all the all these ropes and then now when the other farmers try to farm they they find a lot of these pieces of rope so it makes it harder to to cultivate the land uh, these conglomerates um, form a durational installation in which water different liquids are being power poured uh, twice per day uh, as it happens in the tides uh, like the tides go high tide and low tide twice a day so i try to emulate like this movement of the waters by pouring twice a day these liquids and the liquids are in relationship also with the um, with the area so the liquids are pesticide the first pesticide that was applied in the country that it was this copper sulfate that i already talked about uh, pineapple juice because the pineapple is also one of the monocultures that is affecting uh, iron oxide because iron oxide has uh, this land has a lot of oxide uh, and uh, fresh water like river water and salty water like the sea water um, the idea is that these conglomerates start to crumble and then the materials start to be redistributed in the paper uh, as a way to see how this idea of the fixed boundary or a fixed enclosed idea of land is impossible and that the materials are carried by these flows of water that are constantly coming and going. Um, yeah, and the, here you can see the drawn map of the of the area, no, the, the Sierpe and the Terra River. Um, this is another installation of the work, but it's the same work. And the other piece is called accumulation by conservation. And this work is one of the diagrams that I made for this research. It consists of a drawn, written, and painted diagram. It is made on, to, uh, in, on watercolor paper uh, with salt and fresh water and the pesticide, again, a copper sulfate pesticide that is this blue, greenish thing and liquefied plants, soil, coffee, iron oxide, and and so I already said, yeah. So it has again this copper sulfate. Uh, these materials flow through the paper and bind and mix between each other. Uh, later on, with these traces that this um, liquid state did, uh, I proceed to place certain information in it. So in this case, the information that uh, I wrote here it's from an article from uh, robert flesher and Bram busher that is called accumulation by conservation the same name as the piece and in this diagram they explain how governments business leaders and agents from economic elites seek more stable models of accumulation by conservating the land uh, as a way to overcome this current environmental and financial crisis crisis um, they are really critical about it and they say uh, they deny the contradictions that are uh, inherent or embedded in the this capitalist idea of accumulating uh, and also they outlined uh, the different periods of the conservation policies and how these policies have changed through time and how they relate with the with the different economic periods uh, from capitalism so all this information is is written by hand by using the traces of the dry traces of the 
pesticides and uh, other materials mixed together. Um, this is also like a sort of dry trace of what you can perceive in the conglomerates piece, in the center piece. So this becomes like the dry trace of what already happened or the, what is happening in the other piece. So at the end, the other piece will become also a diagram in a way. Um, also, it's important to say that these pesticides destroy the paper in not so long time. So you can perceive in the piece of um, of uh, that is in Leipzig that the uh, paper is with cracks and holes because the pesticide is destroying the material. And I think at the end it will be completely destroyed in maybe one year or two. Um, now for the conclusions. Um, I want to read a small thing that I wrote. Uh, so land use changes, struggles for land and workers' rights. Pesticide traces are all inscribed in the wetlands. They are inscribed in the different materialities and creatures that mutate, adapt, and decompose in the waterscape. It is traced in the movements of the water that transport the stories up and downstream towards the past and the future. Their artistic procedure, I'm sorry, the artistic procedure seeks to read these alphabets hidden within the layers of sediment, water, and chemicals. These alphabets, which through their traces, shape the topographies of the water scale. Contamination by pesticide is a slow, silent, and elusive process. Catastrophes are not necessarily explosive, nor do they imply an immediate disappearance. Degradation can be difficult to understand and imagine. However, Traces appear on land and water, delving into the layers, inserting themselves in the bodies of those who live closely with them. So I will stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that in this sense, this idea of the catastrophe or the degradation as seen as a slow process is the thing that I'm researching right now. There's a concept that is called slow violence by Robert Nixon uh, that he states how uh, violence can be uh, applied to also, uh, enforced upon the land uh, in a way that is so slow that it becomes almost unperceivable but the, neither, even with that uh, it is a sort a way of violence and that requires different ways of visualizing like visualizing it and um, and right now I'm, I'm working on, on how to visualize these processes that are really slow and almost unperceivable. And I'm focusing in the monoculture of pineapple, which is the monoculture that is uh, right now affecting more the, this area and the country in Costa Rica. So uh, how this violence is affecting the bodies of the exposed species is the, the work that I'm trying to to solve right now. Just like a little bit of a preview of what I will do next. Um, thank you very much. I hope I can connect later to talk to, uh, to talk live uh, with with you. And but if I don't have a good connection because I will be in a place with a really bad connection, um, at least we could talk like this in a recorded way. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I hope you had a nice time. Uh, thank you, Diana, very much for this very, very interesting uh, lecture performance. I really hope you can join us later on. Um, for our next uh, speakers, or our next uh, program point, I want to introduce uh, Huniti Goldocks. Huniti Goldocks are an artist duo consisting of Ares Huniti and Elisa Goldocks. Um, the lecture performance uh, was initially planned um, um, live in the exhibition space with audience, but had to be canceled due to the lockdown in Saxony. So for this reason, I'm actually even more happy that we have a chance to see it uh, in a pre-recorded um, way. Uh, it's called Ether. Um, and very shortly about Huniti Godox practice. 
Um, Elisa and Ares worked together as Unity Goldock since 2019. They are interested in geopolitical realities, marginalized oral histories and contextual research. They like to utilize new media tools, video art, conversations and writing. Uh, they um, work with the work with workshops, excursions, and interventions. Their ongoing thematic focus is water. Uh, Are Shuniti is based in Amman, Jordan, and Lisa Goldogs in Leipzig, Germany. Today, they're both joining us from Germany. And yes, we will uh, start with the pre recorded lecture performance. Um, and later on, both of them will join us for the Q&A. Several traces of a community that flourished during the Neolithic culture of ornamented pottery were uncovered on the west bank of the White Elster River. Individual houses created ceramic vessels and shreds, giving in a collection of a wide range of styles. Some had irregular forms, while others were made using unusual tempering materials. When analyzing both, the geochemical composition of the pottery and the tempering material, archaeologists still debate whether a certain type of clay containing non-malleable particles was deliberately chosen or if these were purposely added to the clay. At this site, 15 kilometers to the south of Leipzig, the village Aitra had once stood it is now disguised behind a veil of nature. This is a search for the not yet and at times not anymore. Through the liquid cover of the Zwenkawa See, sentient beings blurred and the memory of their disappearance blurred with them. Aitra stood on coal. The start of the eviction of the people of the village in 1982, signaled the end of a thousand years of local history. Some say that the justification of the eviction is for the common good. In 1987, when all Aitreas had left their place, this was sealed for many a painful end. Then, the remaining houses fell, and with them fell the last signs of life. This house is still inhabited. The coal excavators ate their way through the Elster hour until autumn 1999 and devoured everything. When former residents of Aitra meet today, it quickly becomes clear how much they still have in common with the places where they were born, spent their childhood and youth, founded a family, buried their parents, relatives and friends. The losses are still on the move. For many, it is their own property, the inherited or self-built house, and the people's sense of belonging.
There was a time when this was called Moonland, but urbanization and ignite open pit mining brought with it a logic that thrives on the contamination and exploitation of native ecosystems. Human and non-human ghosts are slowly populating extractivist zones, canalized waters, and rerouted rivers. They're imagined to be joining a giant organism of soil spreading over the whole continent. Every grain extracted from it shrinks the whole. The rise of environmental problems in the 70s and 80s and the difficulty of escaping the violence of Soviet-style socialism led to the formation of grassroots, church-based opposition or what the GDR saw as a political anarchism. The semi-independent status granted to churches by the Socialist Unity Party of Germany opened up space for more free expression within the church wall. The church became by the 80s a sanctuary for politically inclined people of religious and non-religious backgrounds opposing military rearmament while demanding societal and environmental justice. Only 17% of East Germany's rivers were usable for drinking water, the rest were clinically dead by the 1970s. The demand for lignite mining grew, reaching an annual extraction of 30 million tons. Individuals who were unable to hang their clothes outside due to the dust of sulfur dioxide carried by air particles. Yet, the government claimed that what was in the air was smog brought into the country from the west by the wind. Although the GDR had a law that guarantees the protection of water, air and the flora and fauna of the city, environmental information was not made public.
1988 and 1989, members of an environmental group in Leipzig organized a march to mourn the death of the Pleiße. They called for the urgency of healing the river as a way to heal society. Authorities temporarily arrested more than 80 people who attended. However, the group's insistence on demanding changes led to the peaceful revolution. These demonstrations resulted in the premature phasing out of coal production. After decades of social and spiritual oppression, what does it take to clear the way for healing? What conditions can confabulate and animate new myths? There is a dog of cards here, each revealing a character from Aitra. This is an invitation to reenact one in togetherness. You know the description of who they are and what they could do. Give the character a form in your space.
How does it feel to be stalked by memory, depleted by time, deep in the ashes of the present, or is it not yet? Standing silently by the lake, one can see a ghostly light radiating in the landscape, a light that speaks of the denied lives that exist beyond the gaze of nature manipulation projects. It's been long known that the projects of displacements and contortions wipes out mountains, destroys forests, and poisons rivers. How does sentience look, feel, or sound like in unheard of life forms? In the early 1990s, local activism in Zwenkau and Markleberg resulted in the mine's permanent shutdown. The region's rehabilitation began immediately after that. Both mines were gradually flooded over an eight-year period by river channeling and they have now become two of the area's largest lakes. Isn't this water missing somewhere else? And how much is wasted in condensation from large liquid surfaces into clouds? A brief online look shows the launch of a crowdsourced effort that encourages citizens to collectively reshape the image of the post-mining landscape the promise of connecting new lakes with Leipzig's flowing waterways and canals is forming an exciting new lake district, Neuseenland. The open pits have created more than 20 lakes in recent decades and the project will continue in the area until 2060. The mining corporation will most likely be relieved from liability at that point and will no longer be required to pump groundwater. It has yet to be decided who will be responsible for protecting houses from flooding their basements and ground floors when the majority of private and governmental funds are spent on the construction of the lake's banks, providing this protection is costly. What will future maps look like in a made, unmade and remade world? You are standing by water because water is cheaper than soil. It must have been in the mid-90s when I was around eight years old when my father took us to this mine hole for a walk. He said, one day you will swim here. I looked at the small birch trees growing in the otherwise deserted landscape. I thought, what a crazy imagination. Years later, I started swimming in the lake with many others and saw more water bodies coming to light in the city. He once said, these new waters were some kind of healing and neutralizing matter after the wall came down, distracting and washing away the violence of the past. Do you think the Green River was real?
Listen to the sounds they play for you. The wind, the insects, and the birds. More people migrate here because of the aqua, where everything seems optimally covered. It's been difficult to grasp the physics of how light and shadow works since they switched to nature. Is this nature? Are these waters democratic? No, uh, thank you very much for uh, preparing this amazing lecture performance, Elisa and Arish. I would like to welcome you all now. Yes, thank you. Hello, Elisa. Welcome you all now for the Q and A part. Hello. And Hi. Hello. <laughs> and Constanze, do you want to join us as well? Well, um, until they join us. Ah, yes. Hello, Constanze. <laughs> and Elmas, hi. So it seems that um, Diana did not manage to connect and join us, but um, we will uh, continue like this. Um, yes, um, I would like to start with... Uh, with a first question or maybe more of a, a comment, I would say, about the, the presentations we have just been seeing. Um, it, it seems that especially in the works of Diana Barquero Perez and Trinity Goldux, um, there is, um, they both deal with water ecologies, but also, um, but, and with very specific water ecologies, I have to say. But also uh, in the case of Elma Stanis, there is it may be less, less direct, but there is also there is the landscape of Sri Lanka, and I know there's also a past exhibition of yours that's dealing very specifically with bodies of water. So I just wanted to throw the the question in the round about your thoughts about working with a very specific place how this um, how this is kind of a process how how it is different from working like with topics in general um, maybe you want to may i say something yes please okay, <laughs> okay. um actually um, i know that your question is not directly to my work but yes to practice in general. Um, yeah. <laughs> But uh, um, as an artist, I always have this amazing moment when curators 
uh, invite other artists and introduce us other artists. I mean, audience would feel the same, more or less, uh, the same thing. Uh, that like-mindedness or something that the bothering them, all of them in the same way. I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't see the exhibition, but today I have the, the uh, kind of feeling. Uh, yes, maybe not with my this work, but maybe the other works that can be related to Diana and, you know, the other people. And, and this is amazing. So I want to thank you, uh, both you, once again, before you ask the question, uh, I would like to bring it back to you, actually. That uh, amazing to, 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 to see the connections, like this tiny little connections between the people. It's amazing. So thank you. So, yeah. Maybe we should start uh, maybe uh, expanding the comment and then just transform into a question because uh, Arish and Elisa has been have been working together already for a while and then your research with uh, water ecologies has started in the collaborations in Amman and then it's just now this is this another phase of your research-based practice uh, that is focusing on Leipzig so maybe because in your performance, this was very specific that we wanted to make it for live performance, but because of this uh, cultural lockdown, we couldn't do it. And that's why all, it was only a recording and it was only possible to have it in, a, in an online version. So um, Elisa and Arish, could you maybe a little bit explain your process of uh, working with this uh, water ecologies in Amman and then just how it has transformed into uh, Leipzig? I mean, we realized that um, all water ecologies are very much connected uh, and the geopolitics in different places um, are very much um, facing like similar realities or similar struggles. So um, we felt that when we started in Amman, like researching on a buried water stream that went through Amman before and then got erased during uh, uh, urban development projects, um, doing a project on that and go, then going to Tunisia and like re go, continuing researching on um, the realities of water there on the coast on like colonial projects uh, on the like droning like uh, putting water into the into the Sahara these kind of things we realized that um, we want to create an ongoing body of work that um, consists of like contextual research um, and because like all these uh, different researchers are, are so much like um, speaking to each other. And I think we can see one geographic place disconnected from another one, um, because I think this is something that is a very Western perspective on, on the world, let's say, and to see continents and everything disconnected. And like kind of also, I think to, to um, also uh, start some, some kind of, um, different uh, approach on, on matter and, and all these problematics. I think it's, it's important to, to, con to combine this. And we don't see each project different. Like we, I think we see them all as one somehow. Um, but yeah, coming to Leipzig um, and working here since like thinking about the, the, the context of Leipzig since last year already is um, nice because I, I see like through my whole life that landscape transforming and now putting it into a video work where you that we did this digital reenactment like we go from the from the forest from the wet forest and then going to the mine and then you see it flooding um into this like 24 minutes now of the lecture performance it's something we're really interested to yeah to um uh, put into visuality, but also put into very specific, um, um, uh, like rhetoric or like like text, and and then somehow share also the specific um, history of Leipzig um, with the GDR politics, and because politics are so so connected to to water, you know, in, in many ways. Yeah, and also like from the conversation, like from the lecture performance now. Uh, or like presentation of Diana's work, like she has a line where she says like where earth seems unearthly and like uh, different ways of finding or like rethinking the ways in which we think about borders and territories. And I think that water is something that we can start with as a way of understanding 
um, like how much intervention is being placed onto it and like the idea of rerouting waterways and uh, um, like uh, renaturalization and what does that imply and how this is like how all these efforts that uh, somehow are linked to all uh, urban development uh, uh, ideas are also reducing nature into uh, a commodity. And then how that also in informs the way we relate to our bodies or we engage with the, with the city. Like if you're in a very dry uh, city like Amman where there's no water, but then it, it is built where a water stream would flow through it. So how does that, um, what happens when it trains and the floods and also what does it, um, how does it reflect on people's relationship to the, to the city and to their bodies? And I feel that when we were working on uh, in Leipzig, it was also, there were moments where we were really like questioning, is this real or not? Because you see all these lakes that look very beautiful, but then they're also very man-made because they're filled with water because it's the cheapest solution. So when you swim there, like how do you feel when everything looks real or like natural, but then what are the, uh, underlining um, tones for it that led to its current day reality and how also, yeah, like how also people are using it today, like how it's also being used as a new uh, tourism destination for uh, swimmers, joggers, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Uh, may I actually follow up with the wording that you both actually, both Edmonds and uh, Huniti Goldocks uses uh, the nature, how you actually using, you're both actually in your performances and in your, uh, your um, uh, research and then presentation, you both use this nature and commodification of nature. Uh, which is also now aligned not only uh, in terms of water ecologies in this uh, context, but now how we are just using the nature and then how it is commodified is also another theme in this uh, event that we didn't realize <laughs> until <laughs> now when you started mentioning it. Uh, therefore, I want to just also ask Enmas maybe to expand on this like a commodification and then the way that you are actually using uh, the term nature and then how it is uh, part of your research, because you are also very much focusing how nature is used in this capitalist system. Uh, and then just, you, it's one of your critique in your research. Um, well, actually, uh, I, I realize I have, a, personally, I have some certain moments in my life. Then I realize what is um, very, um, internalized by yourself that you don't talk about it much it's your nature you do it uh, as it is so most of the things were like this before i move into the city when i move into the city i suddenly start to realize that something was wrong then um so uh actually the commodification uh question didn't came as a research question or something like, uh, oh, I observe it, let's go on this. Uh, uh, but I, I see this, uh, uh, why certain things that I cannot communicate with other people. The, the first question was a little bit autistic question. Um, so then I started to work on it. And the more I work on it, I realized that there is some uh, certain, um, like economical structure is like extracting things out of nature and it's destroying what I am relating with it. So it's basically a simple thing. So during the, the, the talks uh, and uh, presentations, I also came um, something that I also look at before that for instance, um, uh, like in Germany, I didn't know that it's easier to go to Romania to look at the, the natural habitat uh, and make some um, scientific experiments with the uh, animals there, because in Germany, they lost them already. But when I look at in the, the, the daily talks and things, and Germany has this 
more um, effort on it. So I truly like their effort, like Arej and Elisa, and bringing up all those things I didn't know. And with this Diana's talk, and it was amazing to see. I think it's all um, connected um, with this um, attention, our attention to this specific lens. And this is not an economical attention. So we should, this, this is very, I think all uh, have this, you know, coming back again and again. It's like all the human effort is related to the economy and how we can change it. Like uh, how I can change this uh, mindset. So yeah, if, I'm not trying to make things clear as an artist, I'm trying to uh, make things more, way more complex and maybe interesting. Thank you. Uh, I would like to jump in here maybe because uh, what you actually said or like also like what Tuche mentioned like at the beginning, this kind of commodification of nature we were talking about um, and also this kind of change of mindset that you just mentioned. I was thinking actually about of one of our starting points for our exhibition, the uh, uh, book by um, theorist Timothy Morton, Humankind, it's called Humankind. Um, uh, what's the humankind? Um, Home is all that. Um, the quotes that you mean? Well, what yes. Else? Well, anyway, it's called the, the first part of the title is called Humankind. Um, and he, he's actually the, talking about this perception of nature um, talking about like as a more like an in-flight entertain like nature as an in-flight entertainment for for humans and talking also about calling this like this anthropocentric environmentalism which is uh, stemming out of this and and of course arguing very much against that and I feel like that's actually the works we've been seeing today all try to propose like a different kind of mindset about of this this kind of env environmentalism that's kind of just trying to protect the commodities basically yeah? but trying to go to dig deeper in the in the mud quite literally i would say yeah i, I think uh, i think my point is also it's i'm just bringing the subject to maybe feminism and those things in in a way, I, I find it very similar in a way. So uh, what is the regime of our thinking? I mean, in my work, it was the, I related with advertisements. And uh, the other way we can say that, okay, this is competitive world. No, I don't accept that. It's not competitive at all. And it's completely different than what we are in it, you know, it's, or what it can be, I mean, I come up with in, in 16th Istanbul Biennial and they, in the curator, um, Nicola Bruyo, introduced us a, an anthropologist, which is called Tim Mingold. And suddenly I just, okay, let's see who is this guy. And then I go into this YouTube search and then I see that what the books he did. And, then, and I end up with finding this, his talk about generosity. And then suddenly imagine that you have this artist thinking even you are just open-minded, but still you have, it's like good, bad, da, 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 da. And suddenly I find this generosity. Is my art is generous. It's better than to asking if it's good or bad. So changing the regime, uh, like a thinking regime about the, the, the nature and our relation is exactly this, to my perspective. I don't know what the other uh, artists would say, but um, yeah, this is what I was trying to say. I say it, I'm happy, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if it's related with, uh, I, I don't know. When you said generosity, actually, um, when we were reading uh, together with Tina the uh, book that we mentioned, Timothy Morton's Humankind, actually, 
the book also was talking about the solidarity. And that was the key word that we were also thinking around. So what does it mean to be in solidarity with non-human organisms and beings? And that's how we actually conceptualized the exhibition, eventually sentient meta, because the way that we wanted to address the solidarity was just actually giving the agency to uh, non-human organisms and then the other, other things that are not necessarily should be othered uh, in the context. Um, that's why for us uh, having uh, Ethira, uh, Irish and Elisa's work was also very much uh, fitting well with the whole concept. And then we are also very grateful that we have been introduced through D21. And that's why I was just wondering how uh, are you, think, have you also think about this kind of a concept of solidarity and generosity in your uh, practice? Or what would you say about this when we are thinking about this sent, sentience uh, concept because you were also addressing this in your installation as well that you wanted to bring this uh, clay from uh, the uh, lake that you have been exploring in your workshop. Maybe we can also talk about this beginning with the workshop and then how you actually wanted to um, bring this uh, material in the exhibition space, uh, Elisa Naresh. I mean, I think we are usually very much into using digital tools, um, but not just because we're, I don't know, um, romanticized or like being obsessed with like technology, but I think because we, we always see it as a way of, sh of sharing certain spaces or bringing people into reimagining spaces or in, in, in this case, like remembering Aitra. And this village is a village that, um, as you heard, used to exist and got uh, demolished uh, for mining. And um, it's an example for many other places in the world that got dispossessed and where people used lose their belongings and their home. And um, so, in our work, we usually don't um, try to be too um, putting too many statements on what is lost or being, uh, you know, like it's more about dressing the reality, like the, the present moment state of a certain place. And yeah, we were kind of questioning, like, how do these elements and this matter kind of, what does it still contain and how much do we still um, how, how can we remember a place and also how will we see that place in the future and then also this question about how will those maps look like in the future when everything is remade at a certain point I mean they call it post mining landscape um, call it renaturalization but what is lost which is this like very dense riverside forest will never come back with the very variety and um, diversity of species and like it's a crazy micro, uh, um, um, macro system and everything is entangled. Uh, now there is very like a, a quite a monoculture and also all this, uh, the ground is not very fertile and it's, it's, it's completely different, yeah. So um, in regards to the, the exhibition, what I want to say is that coming back to the clay, which is clay from the ground of the Zwenkauer See, where Aitra used to be, was a way of kind of, I mean, taking out the clay from the lake was one very physical act. Um, we did that in November um, and we did this again now in the beginning of December in the cold and <laughs> in the wind. And it brings you close to, to matter first of all, but then because we are working a lot with digital media, um, we wanted to have something that is real um, and, and not just some kind of visualization or um, digitalization or yeah I, I f we we wanted to bring that connection and and uh, that's why in the performance we at the beginning in the film we're talking about this there's a thousand year history of Aitra and they found very old pieces of uh, pottery and there is a long culture for that and Aitra was known for that so um, to remember the village in, in some kind of uh, everyday moment like sitting by a table as a uh, as three and then forming clay or getting in touch with matter was something to, to come back to the very basic uh, way and I yeah kind of um, um, reimagining Aitra in a way but Arish maybe you also want to add something to that question. 
Yeah, and also like when we think about uh, like speaking or like imagining sentience on like more than human beings and uh, usually like whenever we have these conversations or even like we're working like it's never an attempt to speak for them or like for other beings because um, it's about trying to engage with the conditions of reality and maybe also using all these different tools as ways of fictionalizing like what is real and what is um, rendered or imagined as a way of creating spaces for engaging with the present in a different way even like when we use VR um, we don't use it as a way to offer like an escape we offer we use it in a way to offer like an embodied state that uh, gives uh, a different way of engaging with the present so I think that yeah when we think about um, other, I mean, I use other as a way of like what lies beyond our understanding of um, matter as well, like in sentience, like well, there's one line that speaks of how can we imagine or start to grapple with unheard of life forms, meaning like the things that we are yet to discover, but then how do we, um, like the thing that we haven't discovered is not something that we don't understand. It's just something that is um, uh, lies beyond our imagination or uh, sensorium. So even in the workshop, because we did like a three-day workshop where we reenacted uh, the Pleiste March, but also we stopped at different uh, um, spots within the city where the violence of uh, this, these interventions are somehow present. And then we did some exercises that uh, activate the body as a way of um, engaging with the reality of the place in different temporal settings. So I feel that, um, yeah, like in these ways, it's good to just allow the, the place itself to also present itself to you in a way. And uh, this is what we tried to do. We didn't want to make any statement on anything we just wanted to be in it somehow just looking at the uh, youtube as well if you have any questions mm -hmm. but at the moment no we have we work but no questions <laughs> okay. i mean i can this is like not completely um connected, but somehow it is, um, it also came to my mind, this is also now for Arish and Elisa, uh, when you talk about this reimagining of territories and about their use of like virtual media and um, um, like material, like clay in the sense that I think that your way of working is also kind of similar as in your like, you are usually in different uh, places on the map <laughs> where you work, you're in different time zones, so you work a lot virtually, but you work with usually with very specific places. And I feel like this kind of your mode of working actually also makes sense with the, the outcome in the end. Uh, I feel like the, maybe it's, I don't feel like this is not a coincidence somehow. Yeah, like the, the also like using cinema 4D and like these rendered spaces also, offers a moment to like just drift into the materiality of the place or the thing that so because sometimes we try to um, translate it in a different language that allows people to also feel something so usually we're just interested in the conversation that comes up after like the story that someone tells us about what they felt in the work but sometimes it doesn't it's not about discussing the work it's more about where like what kind of spaces it takes you to and I think yeah because uh, the nature of also like how these tools allow us to also fictionalize the conditions of the present to understand it in a different way um, so yeah but I think um, usually we really um, experience the place and we really do uh, contextual research in a way that we do a lot of um, exploration on the ground. I think for us it's very important that we, when we speak about things that we um, saw them with our own eyes and felt them with our own senses. Um, so we don't really like to work virtually. We have to because uh, sometimes it's very 
difficult for Alish to get a visa. And also during the pandemic, it was more difficult, but uh, actually we <laughs> prefer to work together. And it was nice that she could come now in November. Thank you, German Embassy again. They kept, <laughs> they kept the passport for very long, which was um, really crazy. But in the same time, yeah, they, they allowed uh, her to come. So, um, yeah, I think that that um, it's sometimes interesting to how do you research and how do you speak about things? Do they have to be? And I think that's why we also like to talk about water, because we feel that we it's, uh, it allows us to speak about very different geographies because um, um, it is not some kind of intervention. It's more like, you know, inviting people into some certain space over the matter of water and like in, in Leipzig, like looking what lies beyond the surface of those lakes. Um, and in a very short time, you know, we are talking about, I don't know, if, uh, 100 years or 80 years of, of the transformation of landscape, which is very crazy and intense. Um, yeah. Talking about visas, unfortunately, Elmas didn't get the visa on time and she couldn't come. <laughs> yeah, but thanks to German embassy, they grant me with a year visa. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, <laughs> bravo. Probably they realize, that, oh, she missed that. Oh. <laughs> Oh. Uh, so now, now you got one year. Yeah, amazing. Afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. So now I you mean, can. I mean, the visa is granted on the first of December, <laughs> and I. Still, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Anyway, so they realize that oh, this is wrong. Oh, what we can do? <laughs> so, <laughs> I think everything is uh, happening in the office. They like, oh. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I didn't say anything bad before because, um, you know, uh, there are cases you can have visa for the, your exactly the, the frame of your visiting, which I'm lucky they, they, then I have it. I know, uh, okay. But yeah. actually, I, 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 I mean, when you were talking, I come up with this thing. Um, um, you, Elisa, and um, Arey, 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 Arey. Yeah. Uh, you born and grew up in different places. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. this is this is nothing to do with the the up outcome of your artworks or whatever. But I mean, um, I'm curious about your first hand experience of I mean. What make your attention so great? <laughs> that would be my question. That what, what, what makes you, both of you, into the something that many people will put on look, you know? I mean, <laughs> um, like, I think we both have, like, similar interests in terms of, like, understanding the politics of things, but also materializing it and also following a process where you engage so much with the place and also find, allow yourself to engage with it in a way where a lot of things appear to you and then you find the way of translating it. And I think that hmm. it's just like a, an intuitive approach, like, it's not... So, because you know, like it's difficult also to work with people sometimes because everyone has a very specific way of working, and sometimes it's about just realizing an idea uh, that is already cooked in your mind before you go to a place. But I think that for us, it's more about going to a place and uh, following the intuition and then seeing what appears, and yeah, like being just in in the in the moment. And I feel that a lot of times we have uh, moments where we have the same, not the same thought, but like the same realizations. And then it becomes mm. like a, an intuitive thing. And then we can write about it or whatever. Like usually it's like a process. Uh, I think, yeah, it's very much about seeing a place and unseeing it in a way. And like mm. try to Re, like this term reimagining we use it a lot so and then inviting people into that process so that's why mm -hmm. we also like to do workshops or excursions or this we are it's not just about the technical kind of um 
you know, hype about it, but like more about like, you know, creating the space and bringing people into it. I mean, we did one project about an abandoned fun park in Amman mm -hmm. and we uh, involved people into imagining what could, what could be done with it? What would you do with that space? And then we also created virtual reality and then showed it in public space and people know this fun park. And then, you know, like not seeing the place that um, the surface of the, of the place and trying to unlearn what you learned about and try to, and I think this has a lot to do with politics and that has a lot to do with like kind of the agency of the individuals, but also like the responsibility for territories. Yeah, I think that um, the same with like the lake. Okay, you can see it for what it is, but I think what lies beyond it, I think it's something that is very um, intense um, to, to digest almost, but I think um, it could sh shift this this resp or like or, or or make people feel more responsible or I mean it's it's not people are not supposed to f to think in a certain way this is not the idea but like it's an invitation or and yeah we have the we met uh, three years ago and we had a very and we found each other just in this kind of uh, collaborative manner same you know same way of approaching things um, yeah. But uh, hmm. no, we, yeah, uh, very interesting. I mean, yeah. Thing, it's yeah. a good time that we wrap mm -hmm. up our conversation. Okay. Uh, it's almost eight o'clock now, and uh, thank you so much to D Twenty One for uh, inviting us to their program. And this was the last online event of Sentient Matter. And in this event, we were very happy to welcome Elmas, Diana, Aresh, and Elisa. Um, so yeah. yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, thank you also. Thanks everyone. to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Tina thank and you Tuche, so and Dina uh, D21, Constance and uh, Sandra, we were working with before. So thank you. It was okay. very nice being part of this this year. <laughs> I would love to be there. <laughs> yeah, it was next time. Next time. <laughs> We're coming to Istanbul one night, so maybe we managed yeah, to I meet. Yeah, I know. We are going. To <laughs> yes, <laughs> will be happening. Okay. Yeah, very excited. <laughs> okay, see you in Istanbul, and audience, you can come by also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to organize. <laughs> Yes, we're very <laughs> happy. <laughs> very happy about it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.